Well, our scripture passage for today comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Listen now for God's word. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, when I lived in Sarasota, Florida, I had uh, moved down as a high school student from Pennsylvania, and one of my friends came back to visit me. And uh, She was a very cultured person, way more sophisticated than me, way more traveled than me. So I thought, I better take her to someplace good. So I took her to the uh, art museum in Sarasota, which is called the the Ringling Museum of Art. And we walked in, and she was shocked. I looked, and I was like, well, I don't know. These paintings look kind of like paintings to me. Like, what's going on? She said, no. It's not the paintings, it's the walls. I said, well, they look like walls to me. I don't see what's wrong. She said, they're crazy colors. Most times when you walk into an art gallery, gallery, they'll they'll paint paint the walls uh, beige or white or a gray or some neutral color. So you're just looking at the painting. But she said, if you hang a painting on a bright red wall, you see all the red in that painting. If you hang a painting on a bright blue wall, you see all the blues in that painting. The paint, your eyes look at the painting differently depending on the color of wall behind it. Then she looked at it again and she said, I like it. It looks good. Well, we are continuing, actually, we are finishing, believe it or not, our six-week adventure using Martha Grace Reese's book, Unbinding Your Heart. We've been looking at how to share our faith. We've been looking at evangelism. And I don't know about y'all, but just before I did this, just about the only evangelism sermons I ever heard were on this passage today. I've heard it many times. Maybe some of you have heard this passage in Matthew 28 many times. It's called the Great Commission. And we love to quote it to each other. But I gotta tell you, when I sat down and started preparing this sermon, it was almost like I'd hung this passage on a bright red wall. I'd hung it on the unbinding wall. These last 40 days of prayer and Bible study made me look at this passage in a whole new way. And something stood out to me that's never stood out to me before. And that's this wonderful part of verse 18 where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's straight out of our Unbinding series. The whole sermon series has been on this verse so far. I'm talking about the earlier in in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 18, where it says, Whatever, wherever we gather, two or three gathered gathered together in Jesus' name. Whenever we do that, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. 
And whatever we unbind on earth is unbound in heaven. So Jesus has all the power. He has his fingers on the knots in every heart here on earth. And on all the grace tied up in heaven. And he's just waiting for us to ask him to untie, to unbind those knots so that his grace can flow down from heaven to earth. But then comes the kicker. Two powerful words. Therefore, go. Therefore, because Jesus has all authority on earth and in heaven, go. That's what today is about. Because this power is not about us. That's not why God gave Jesus all power under heaven and earth. That's not why we've been doing these 40 days. It's not just so that we store up power, more, 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 more power, like a big old water tank. No. It's so that through us, that power can flow out to our friends, our neighbors, our families, our colleagues. It's not power that's meant to stay rooted in one place. It's power that's meant to go. And it always has been. If you remember how I started this sermon series six weeks ago, we started with the wonderful covenant of Abraham, Abraham's call in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham was minding his own business way 700 miles to the north of Israel when God woke him up and told him, I'm going to give you so much power, Abraham. Everything the ancient world could imagine was power. I'm going to give you land, titles, wealth, and children. And therefore, go. Go down to the land of Canaan. Because through you, I am going to bless all the nations of the world. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing on the mountain. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 28, is unbinding Abraham's promise. For thousands of years, that wonderful promise had been bound, tied up into the land of Canaan, into the land of Israel. But on that mountaintop, Jesus unties the thread and says to the disciples, to these 11 descendants, these 11 children of Abraham, therefore, go. Go and fulfill the promise made to your father Abraham and baptize all nations. The word is ethne, ethnic groups. Every race, every tribe, every language on earth. Share with them the blessing that I am giving you under heaven and earth. And they did. They went throughout the entire ancient world and then beyond through all history until this very day, this very place. That blessing, that commission that Jesus gave on that mountainside has flowed downstream 2,000 years to us here today. Because Jesus has created the church to be constantly moving to the next person. To be constantly delivering the gospel to the next nation. The next frontier. To be always pushing out to find that lost sheep. To always be searching in the cracks, in the forgotten places 
for that lost coin to be always scanning the horizon, running after our lost brothers and sisters who don't know that they have a home here in God's house. So therefore, we go. It explains why these early disciples, these early Christians, 1800, 1900 years ago, when they wanted to draw a picture of the church, they couldn't put a, put a big old billboard on Memorial Parkway. Church was underground. It was illegal. They didn't draw pictures of buildings with crosses on the top. They met in ordinary houses. So when they wanted to represent what the church is, you can go today to Rome, to hidden secret catacombs under the earth, and you don't see pictures of church buildings. You see pictures of ships. You see pictures of boats with sails. When they wanted to draw the church, the first Christians drew the fastest thing on earth. The superhighway of the ancient world. Ships. Because we serve, we are part of a church on the go. This is the same image that Martha Grace Reese uses in this final chapter of your books, chapter 6. And what you guys have done in the last 40 days is totally remarkable. Many, many churches have tried to do this curriculum. And many, many churches have failed because it is so demanding. But we did it. We are now at the top of that mountain. We are part of the few churches who were able to not just get a few of the ringers, not just the session, not just the pastors, but the whole church, all the way from little bitty kids, all the way up to senior adults and youth and young people in between. All of us reading our Bibles and praying the same things every day, getting together, discussing in small groups, willing to be flexible enough to put up different kinds of decorations, worship a little bit differently. We've done it. And so, we can hear Jesus' voice saying, Therefore, go. I feel like the last 40 days, what we have done as a church, what we have done as a ship crew, is we have hoisted the sail up. If you've ever been on a sailboat, you know it is hard work to hoist that sail up. It's heavy, you gotta pull, you gotta pull together. But it's not lifting up the sail that makes you go. It's the incredible, way more powerful than us, wind that makes the sailboat go. And right after this story we read today, the next big thing that happens in Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. When these same disciples are gathered up in an upper room, and the Bible says they heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind blowing in and sending them out. If I think back seven years ago when I first opened up my campus mailbox at University of Florida and these, that, that purple book was waiting for me, 
and it sat on my desk unread for two weeks. And then I opened up the pages and started reading. I could never have guessed. You could have given me a thousand yellow legal pads and given me a million guesses and I would never have guessed that my voyage would have blown me up to New York City, over to Princeton Seminary, and down here to Huntsville, Alabama, with all of you. Never could have guessed it. But when I opened up those pages, the wind of God began to blow. And it's not by my power that I'm here today. I've been faithful in hoisting my sail, and this is where I am, by God's grace. And that's what we've done these last 40 days. What I feel right now is what I felt seven years ago when my dad was driving me back home from grad school and he said, David, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I have no idea, Dad. But I know one thing. The most important thing I will do with my life is tell people the difference that Jesus Christ makes in my life. So we hear the voice of Jesus on the mountaintop saying, therefore, go. The question remains, go where? Go how? That's something we're all going to have to figure out together over the next 12 months. We're going to have to do some experiments. We're going to have to try some stuff out. But as we do that, the one piece of advice I can give us today is that we got to keep the main thing the main thing. Remember those three circles we've been focusing on, that we learned that the churches that do great evangelism have these three circles, relationship with God, a real relationship with God, a real relationship with one another, inside the church and real relationships outside the church. So start with that circle, your relationship with God. What have you learned these last 40 days? Was there a prayer you did, one of those 40 prayer exercises that you thought, this clicks, this is good, I connect with God. Keep doing that one or two or three, keep it up. How about your relationships with other people inside the church? Did you try out volunteering in a new way? Or did you um, share with somebody in a more meaningful, deeper way? Or pray with somebody in a deeper way in the last 40 days? If so, keep it up. Keep doing those things that are making great, strong, real relationships inside this church for you. And last, and most importantly, as a whole church, let's go to that third circle. It's hard. It's going to take some practice. It's going to take some false starts. But we can do it with the power of God, with the power of our teamwork and relationships here in this church. We, together, can go and build great relationships outside of our church. Remember what I was saying about upside down evangelism. That doesn't mean you have to have all the answers. You can be the person with all the questions. If you meet somebody who's already a member of a church, ask them, what are you all doing that's good? Or why don't you all come visit us and tell us what we could do better? If you meet somebody who's not inside the church, you can always use what I learned and ask them, what's the one thing that if you saw it would make you want to come to church? 
or simply ask, I want to do better. Can you give me some free advice? What do you think about God? I'd love to hear. Those are great questions to ask as we journey forth, as we go into that third circle. So, let's go. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus didn't wait for us to go to him. Instead, while we were still sinners, Jesus chose to go to us. He left the throne. He left the right hand of God so that he could come to us. He invites us. He saves us through his death and resurrection. And he welcomes each of us here today to this communion table this banquet table. This table doesn't belong to us. This mission does not belong to us. The fruit, if we see any fruit in the next year, does not belong to us. It belongs to Jesus. And so today, if you place your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, Come to this table because it has been prepared for you. Let's join together now in our Covenant Presbyterian unbinding prayer one last time found in your bulletin. Saying together, Father, we come to you grateful for the many blessings you have given us to do your will. Jesus, give us your heart so we may join you in the pursuit of the lost. Cleanse us and heal our brokenness so that we can love and reach out to others. Holy Spirit, keep us hungry and thirsty for your word so that we will be strengthened, gain your wisdom, and have the boldness to share our faith. May the earth be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. <clears throat>